All right, you may be seated. We're glad you're here. We want to welcome everybody that's tuning in on live stream, and we appreciate them being a part of what we're doing and, and grateful for, for each one of you that are listening in on our services today. And what a great crowd here this morning. Thank you for being a part of our service today. Well, we've got a quartet of ladies that's going to come and sing for us now, so I want you to listen uh, to their uh, ministry and song, and I know that they will uh, be a blessing to you. Thank you, ladies. Wasn't that great? Thank you for that. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of James. Book of James, chapter number 4 is where we're going to be. James, chapter number 4. James chapter 4, we're going to begin reading in verse number 13. James chapter 4 and verse number 13. Under the inspiration of God's Spirit, James writes these words, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's interesting that phrase, go to now. Go to now, ye that say, 
And this is what we're going to do. We're going to go into such a city and we're going to set up shop for a year. We're going to buy and sell and everything's going to go smoothly. You know, the, you know what that means, go to now? It means get out of here. How many of you know what I'm talking about, that saying? Okay. Want to make sure it wasn't just a southern thing. Just get out of here. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. Go to now. That's what he's saying to them. Get out of here. You think you can plan your life and everything's going to go as you planned? Rarely do things always go as we plan. So he says, get out of here. And then, then the great statement. You don't even know what's going to happen when the sun rises. Okay. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. Let's pray. Father, help us, would you, today, please? We gather in this place, your place, in your name, with your word and your people needing your help. And so do for us, our Heavenly Father, what only you can do. Deal, delve deeply in all of us. Be thorough with us, dear Jesus, and Draw us to a place of decision that you would have us to come. In each and every life, as only you can do, would you apply your word as needed. We'll thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. If you're familiar with the history of Major League Baseball, then you probably know the name Yogi Berra. I grew up hearing the name of people like Yogi Berra and Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris and all those guys. They were playing when I was young. And in fact, I was so, I was so involved in baseball that when I was 12 years old, I went to hear a, a baseball player for the New York Yankees that Yogi Berra played for. He, he played second base. His name was Bobby Richardson, and, and Bobby that day gave the gospel message as a part of his testimony. I went to hear him talk about baseball. He wound up talking about Jesus Christ. And that day, as a 12-year-old boy, I turned my life over to Christ and trusted Him as my Savior. And to this very day, I'm thankful for what a baseball player did in impacting my life. A number of years ago, a number of year ago, years ago, my son had stopped by. Bobby and I had had some connection over the years but my son stopped by just to tell him about what had happened in my life. And my phone buzzed, and it was from my son. And I answered it on a FaceTime call, and it was Bobby Richardson. And I sat in my living room, and we talked together. And he said to me, he told me the story of how he came to Savannah. Wasn't on his schedule. A friend asked a personal favor, and he changed his schedule just to be in Savannah, Georgia, that one Friday night. And he said, Dean, I'm so glad I came. Because if God didn't plan it for anybody else, there was a 12-year-old boy there that needed it. Well, Yogi Berra played on the team with Bobby Richardson. He was an 18-time, Yogi Berra was, an 18-time All-Star and a three-time MVP as catcher. He appeared in 14 World Series, winning 10 of those, and ultimately was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Great player, great guy. One of the most notable things about Yogi was not just his, his ability to play ball, but it was his, it was his funny sayings. They, they're called Barraisms. He had little quips that he would throw out, and really, honestly, they made no real sense, but they had a measure of truth to them. And so he became famous for his Barraisms. Let me give you a couple of those. He said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Okay. All right. He said another one. He said, you can observe a lot by just watching. Okay. Well, that's what observing is. I love this one. He said, it's like deja vu all over again. I felt that way last night when Georgia played Alabama. Okay. This is deja vu all over again. Another one he said, he said, baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. <laughs> Here's another one. A nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. 
And then he said this, he said, in, in describing why they lost a particular series, he said this, we made too many wrong mistakes. <laughs> Yogi Bear, what a character. This year, in the World Series, my Atlanta Braves were leading the Houston Astros six to nothing. And the game was somewhat winding down. The Braves had already hit two home runs, and uh, the Astros were not doing very well at the plate. And so the announcer, Joe Buck, who, who comes from a, a line of, of, his dad was a famous announcer, and Joe's done a great job with baseball himself. He realized that if the Astros did not change the direction of the game quickly, then, then all hope was going to be gone. They're, if something doesn't happen right away, they're not going to win this game. And so Joe Buck borrowed a quip from Yogi Berra, and this is what he said, it's getting late early for the Astros. It's getting late early for the Astros. Now that's what our text is teaching us. What is your life? It's, it's just a vapor. No, no, you're planning on, you've got it all mapped out. You've got it all planned out. I, I'm going to a city. I'm setting up shop. I'm going to spend the next year doing this and this and this. And, and, and we're so forward-looking sometimes. We're so visionary sometimes. We don't forget how fragile life really is. And so God reminds us in this text, and He says to us, hey, you may think you're going to do that, but it could just be that it's getting late early for you. Later than you really think. First, the reminder. First, the reminder, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. Then the question for what is your life. Then the answer is just a vapor. So God lays it out for us. I, I, think that, I think that we have a tendency to overestimate the amount of time in our account. We sort of feel like, we, we, yeah, look, I'm young. Can I tell you that as a pastor, I've stood in sad services over all different ages, all different levels of life, and buried people in their, in their infanthood, in their early adolescence, in their teen years, in their young adulthood, middle-aged and elderly. I'm just going to tell you that sometimes it's getting late early and we don't know it. We know, we know that 2021 is winding down, but we, <clears throat> we may not have as much time left in our life account as we realize. We don't know. Because you don't know, nor do I know, what shall be on the morrow we don't even have a promise of this afternoon, much less next year. And so with that thought in mind of it getting late early, I want to I talk with you about some, some ways that that should affect us and, and, and some things that we should consider with the warning from God, with the reminder from God that our life is but a vapor and it could be getting late early, let me tell you some things we ought to consider. First of all, I would suggest that we consider our ways. We consider our ways, because the reality of the matter is it may be getting late for us to make some much-needed changes in our life. It could be that, that we don't have the time that we think we have to make some adjustments, to do things differently. It could be, it could be that... that, that if we leave where we are, how we are, it could be that the legacy that we leave behind will not be one that we want to be remembered by. It could be that we're at a point in life where we desperately need to make some changes and, and to rid our life of certain things that, that, that plague us. Haggai chapter 1 Verse 3 through 7, let me read those for you. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house to lie waste. You know what he's saying? He's saying, look, you're, spending, you're putting all of your energy in building and setting up shop for you, but you've not considered the house of God. That's what he's saying to the Jewish people that were more self-concerned than they were spiritual. And, and so he said, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, 
but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Listen, consider your ways. And it could very well be that it's getting late early to make some changes. Have you ever looked at your life and you thought, I have nothing to show for it? There's nothing to show for my life. I've got a bag filled with everything that I want, and yet when I get to the end of things, it's empty. I, I, I eat, but I'm hungry. I, I clothe, but I'm, I, I'm cold. I, I, I drink, but I'm never filled. It, he, what he's saying there is that all of our energy, we're pouring into things that aren't satisfying to us, and in the end, we're empty-handed. I'll tell you the story of the first funeral that I ever preached. It was for an 83-year-old man. I was right out of Bible college, right on staff at my church, and they came to me and said, you're going to do a funeral this week. And I said, I've never done a funeral before. And they said, you won't be able to say that after this week. And so I go to a house, and I'm, there's an 82-year-old lady there, and her brother, who's 83, had died. And I find out they have literally no family left, none, zero, nobody, him and her. And I went to the funeral, and I stood to preach the funeral, and there she was sitting with the family, actually on my left, sitting with the family, and over on the right was the pallbearers, and the pallbearers were employees of the funeral home. And as I sat there, as I sat there thinking before, before the, the, the music started, uh, uh, stopped, I, I sat there thinking to myself, what kind of a man lives 83 years on this earth and impacts nobody to the degree that no one shows up at his funeral. It's a sad life to me. I was grateful that a couple of weeks later, actually a week later, that his sister came to know Christ as her Savior. I was grateful for that God appointment God brought into my life. But I'm just simply saying it, it may be time that we consider our ways. Listen, today's direction determines tomorrow's destiny. Don't ever forget that. Today's direction determines tomorrow's destiny. If you keep going in the direction that you're going in, where does that lead you? Where will you be five years from now? Where will you be five months from now? Where will you be, where will you be at the ending of two, 2022? If you continue in the wrong direction, you cannot but end up in the wrong place. Listen, the wrong direction does not lead to the right destination. And so it's very important that we, that, 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 that we make the changes. Proverbs 4, 26, Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. What is he saying? Think about where you're going. Think about where, where your direction is leading you. Think about that. And so this is a given. If you continue to do the things you're doing, you continue to get the results you're getting. It's just a given. If you continue to do the things you're doing, you will continue to get the same results time and time again. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall do what? Direct thy paths, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And so it's time to trust. It's trusting time. It's time that we, that we make the changes that are necessary in our life. Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So how do we make the changes? Okay, how do we get to the place to where we consider our ways and determine what changes need to be made? We do so in light of the Word of God. And so if I want to change my way, I have to take this book, which is a light and a lamp, and I have to shine it on the path that I'm going on, and I have to say, oh man, I don't like this. I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go the other way. I talked with a friend of mine that climbed Mount Rainier twice, and he said he'd never do it again. He went up. He went up early with, with some climbers, and, and, and they summited in the dark. And on the way back down, he said to, to, to the team that he was with, he said, I don't want to go this way. I don't, I don't like this. These crevasses and things, this is too dangerous. I don't want to go here. I want to go the, another way. And they said to him, this is the exact way you came up this morning. We're just retracing our steps. It was just dark, and you can't see it. You know what this word does? It, it illuminates the path for us so that we can see where not to go. Not just where to go, but where not to go. I told you the story 
uh, of, of the young lady that was sitting outside of her pastor's office. And the secretary said, uh, he'll see you in just a moment. She had a, an appointment to see her pastor. In just a moment, the door opened and the pastor, uh, uh, pastor came to the door and a, uh, an elderly lady that, that, was, that was middle-aged walked out. Her face was stained with tears and she was obviously emotionally upset. And the young girl was walking to the office and they passed each other and hesitated for just a moment. And, and then she went inside the office. And when she sat down, she said, Pastor, I don't mean to be nosy. But she was, obviously, she was obviously messed up over something. What was wrong with her? And this is what he said to her in great wisdom. She's coming back from where you're headed. And I want to tell you, we better, we better be wise enough to ponder the path of our feet. Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. Can I, can I suggest this to you? As you bury the old year, and it's coming to an end. We've just got weeks left. As you bury the old year, why don't you, why don't you toss in that, that cavity, that grave? Why don't you toss in there your bad habits? Why don't you toss in there your sad regrets? Why don't you toss in into there the, 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 the woundedness where people have injured you. and Why don't you throw that into the grave and, and bury it with the old year? Why don't you leave it behind and let all of those things be a part of what once was, not what is? Rid your life of, of those things. Not only that, should we consider our ways, but we should consider our faithfulness. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. You know the one thing that God asks of you is not talent? Aren't you glad for that? Every now and then I sing. And around the house I'll sing to the grandkids and they're repulsed by it. Okay? So God did not grant me that. You know, which makes me enjoy it even more, to be honest with you. you know, that's, that's even more of a blessing. And uh, I sing to my wife all the time. And she rolls her eyes all the time. But anyhow, it's not, it's not really the most romantic thing. But really, God doesn't require me to sing. He doesn't require me to have great talents. He doesn't require me to be a multitasker or somebody that, that has all this ability. You know what God requires of Dean? He requires of Dean the same thing he requires of you. He requires us to be found simply faithful. Now, wait a minute. I can't sing. And I don't have the skills that some of you have. I love to sit around talking to our men and the things they're doing, and, and I'm, I'm amazed by it. I, I don't have that. When we built the room onto the back of our, our house that we call our grandkids' room, I got Ron Mackey to come. You know why? Because I can't do what he can do. So I just sat there and said, I can get a hammer. I can hold a board. You tell me what to do. We'll do it. And Ron built that building. We had, we had Doug Olson ca come in. I love Doug and miss him. You know, Doug came in. We put up sheetrock, and he mudded it. And, and, and the reality of the matter is simply this. I don't have those skills. Listen, I can't do certain things, but I can be faithful. Even though I can't sing, even though I'm not a person of maybe perhaps uh, multiple skills, I can, I can be faithful. And by the way, every single one of us, we can all be faithful. That's not out of the reach of any one of us. So God doesn't require something of you that, 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 that is out of your reach. Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. That's what we all want to hear when we stand before the Lord in heaven. And, and it may be getting late early for us to get serious about our service. And we all have excuses as to why we aren't, to why we're not involved, to why we're not engaged. We have excuses for why. But I don't think that those are going to <coughs> hold up very well when we stand before the Lord. Whatever you do, if it's setting up chairs or taking down chairs or sweeping the floor or bagging up trash or rolling up the mats or loading the trailer or 
or cleaning up a coffee stain or wiping down the tables or vacuuming the entrance or setting out songbooks or singing a special or running the soundboard or teaching a class or, or bringing refreshments or leading singing or shoveling snow or greeting visitors. Whatever it is, it should all be done to the glory of God. Because here's the deal. Listen to me. There is as much honor in wiping a table and cleaning a coffee stain and putting chairs in the trailer. There's as much honor in doing that as in what I am doing right now this morning declaring the Word of God. There's as much honor. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So everything we do should be done for one reason, and that's God's glory. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power which worketh in us. Listen, unto him be glory in the church. So everything we do here at South Valley, Everything we do in our family of friends ought to be done not to, not to make ourselves look good or not to get the spotlight on who we are. It ought to be done so that God would get glory and be praised because of our service. Let, let, me, let me help you with this. Churches are filled today with people who come only for one reason, and that's to receive a blessing. And by the way, you ought to come expecting a blessing at church because this, this is a great place to be blessed. But that, not be, that, not, that not ought to be the only reason why you come. You don't come just to get a blessing. You should come also to give one. Hebrews 13, 16, But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for su with such sacrifices God is well pleased. What he's saying there to them is simply this. Don't, don't, don't go just to get a blessing. Go to be a be a blessing. Let me tell you something. Listen, listen, this is so important. God doesn't, God doesn't um, bless you so that you can just raise your standard of living. God blesses you so that you can raise your standard of giving. And I'm not talking about necessarily dollars in an offering plate. That's a part of how we give, but there's so much more than that. It's giving of ourself. It's giving of our encouragement. God doesn't, God doesn't encourage you just so that you can be encouraged. God encourages you so that you can go find somebody else and encourage them. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. Find somebody that's hurting and encourage them. God gives you something, give something to somebody else. He's, he, is, he is giving to you because everything God ever created, He created to give. For God so loved the world. Well, how do I know that? That He, what? Gave. So God's a giver, and if we're going to be like our Heavenly Father, we've got, to be, we've got to be givers also. Here's the concept. You ready for this? You're not. I can tell by looking at you. I'm going to give it anyhow. Here's a, con here's a concept that will change your entire outlook on church. Come to be a blessing. Come looking to be blessed to be a blessing. Come, come to find somebody that you can uh, be a blessing to. Just By the way, just being here automatically blesses others. It blesses me. I'm your pastor. When you're not here, I worry and concerned about you. And worry maybe is a too strong of a word, but I, I'm concerned. I, you being here is a blessing to me. So, so, so try to bless people. Get around and greet folks and share a smile and give a kind word and pay a compliment. People work in a dog-eat-dog-kick-in-the-gut world. And when they come to the house of God, they need a place where they can hear a, a kind word and a, see a smiling face and a joyful heart and a pat on the back and an arm around the shoulder and a how are you and can I pray for you about something. We Listen, this ought to be the pick-me-up place. This ought to be a place where people no, you know. we got to get the truth and sometimes the truth skins our hide. Does me. Sometimes this book is like, oh, me. And sometimes I'm, I, I read it and I'm like, wow, that's great. And sometimes I read it and it's like, mm, I'm not so great. But, but, but church ought to be a place where family gets together and, and, and where we come 
to be a blessing to other people. That ought to be in everything we do. Try coming to be a blessing rather than just receiving a blessing. Don't just come, don't just come to what blesses you. Come to what you can use to bless other people. And that's everything we do. Our young adult activities, college and career teens, men's meetings, band of brothers, our, our ladies' functions, our, our king's daughters' luncheons, their, their ornament night, our school connections group. Everything we do is an opportunity not just for you to be blessed. It's an opportunity for you to bless other people. And by the way, let me just throw this ad out for you, okay? The Christmas fellowships are an absolutely great time to start that. 2022, we got some wonderful things planned. Our staff meeting, I think this year, was the most productive uh, uh, that we've ever had, especially coming out of this COVID season. And we're so excited about things. I hope that this year, before we get into the new year, you'll make up your mind, I'm plugging in. I'm going to be a part of this. Don't, don't miss out. Set your heart on being involved. Next thing I want to tell you we ought to consider, if it's getting late early, is we ought to consider eternity. Consider our eternity. It may be getting late for that. If you're here, if you're here and you, um, you're not certain of your salvation, when are you going to do that? My pastor used to have a saying that I've never forgot. He said this, tomorrow is the first word in the devil's vocabulary. So if, if Satan can convince you to procrastinate your salvation, he'll, you'll procrastinate right into hell. Well, I didn't come to church to hear about hell. Well, then, then Jesus spoke more of hell than he did of heaven. And he warns us. That there are two eternal destinies and two only. There's no hangover place. There's no in-between place. There's no limbo in between. There's no purgatory. There's none of that. It's either heaven or hell, one of the two. And if you go to hell by rejecting Jesus Christ, you'll be a trespasser because Matthew 25 says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Jesus came down to be your way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. See, the only hope that you have of heaven is not living good and doing right. And by the way, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And so there's no better time, according to the Bible, than today. I remember a summer camp in southeast Georgia, down in the Okefenokee Swamp. A young man named Theron came to camp with us. And, and, and at, 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 at one of the services at night... Theron came down to an altar, and I took an open Bible and knelt beside him and showed him God's plan of salvation. And right there at that altar, Theron <coughs> bowed his head, excuse me, and trusted Christ as his Savior. Got born again that very same day. What Theron did not know, and what I did not know that day, is that it was getting late early for Theron. And before the next year came around, before camp was again, Theron had fallen over dead as a young 16-year-old boy and went out into eternity. <clears throat> I want to tell you, it could be getting late early. Hebrews 3.15, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Now, I don't know who I'm preaching to today. I don't know who you are. I don't know, I don't know who you are. But I know that God directed clearly this point and he wants, me to, he wants me to say clearly to you, it could be getting late early for you. As a young pastor in my first pastorate, I preached a message on hell one Sunday, warning people of the eternal destiny and the consequences of rejecting Christ as their Savior. And a man got up when church was over, walked out angrily, walked through the doorway before I could get there, a group of people that was out in the yard, he announced to them loudly and clearly that he would never put his foot in church again. He was not going to hear that kind of preaching. He wanted nothing to do with it. Got in his car, sped out of the parking lot, squalled his tires as he disappeared. Within 10 days, he was dead. I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't matter. He could have lived 10 years. 
Could have lived 20 years. Doesn't matter. If you reject Jesus Christ, the destiny is absolutely the same. Doesn't matter whether you're angry or calm. Doesn't matter whether you're good or bad. Because it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's according to His mercy He saved us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. So you can't work your way to heaven. You can't pay your way. You can't earn your way. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I'm just simply telling you <clears throat> that, that, that you have to come to Christ in order to go to heaven. As a 17-year-old boy, I witnessed to our neighborhood drunk. I'll never forget, he sat there and told me, he said, I believe what you're saying is true. And before I die, I'm a young man, Dean, I'm 56 years old. Before I die, I'll trust your Christ and settle my score with the Lord. Within a month, his son found him dead in his home. And I remember the news that came to me as just a young boy. It made me realize once again that it could be getting late early for some people. I'm just going to tell you, we, 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 have to, we have to wake up. Remember the story in Luke chapter 12 of the rich man? And, and, and he said, I, I, look, here's what I'm going to do. Things are going so good, I'm going to build more barns. <clears throat> Every concern he had was now. I'm going to build barns. I want to store more food. I want to grow my business. I'm going to give everything I've got, all of my attention, all of my focus, all of my heart. I'm going to pour it into what's right now. But verse 26 of Luke 12 says, But God said unto him this, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. And who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Folks, I want you to look at me. You'll leave it all behind one day. You will leave it all behind. Some of the worst things that I've ever had to deal with in the pastorate is families that fight over the things that have been left behind by the person that's already departed. People that at one time were in great harmony, brothers and sisters, and now they're hating each other and suing each other. Why? Because there's a little nest egg left there, and they're trying to claim their chunk of it. See? The reality of the matter is you better prepare to meet your God. And the only way you do that is through Christ. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Proverbs 27, verse 1. It's not about being, it's not about being scared. It's about being smart. Because the reality of the matter is, as David prayed in Psalm 90, he said, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We have no promise of tomorrow or even next year. It could be getting late. It could be getting late early. You better make sure of your salvation, of your eternity. Last of all, and I close with this, you should consider your relationships. You should consider your relationships. It could be getting late early for you to mend some fractured relationships with people. It could be getting late early and if you don't do it now, it could just very well be that all you're left with is a heart full of regrets. You split things and things became splintered. And maybe, maybe, maybe it's the result of someone else's decision, but, but things are left in shambles and shards all around you. And the relationship is dead. And pride has stepped upon the throne. And we're going to wish we had reached out and buried the hatchet. But there will come a time when it's too late to do that. And it could be getting late early. As a pastor, I have stood at funerals and literally pulled people out of caskets that lunged for the body of their dead loved one because they were so racked with sorrow and grief. I remember a young man that constantly cursed his mother and belittled her. I remember at the funeral, I remember his deep guttural sobs as he wished he had done better, as he had wished he had asked for forgiveness, as he had wished he, he had told her how sorry he was for the scars that he placed upon her heart. But at the funeral, and he looked into her ashen white face, it was too late, and he lunged for her sobbing, crying, 
sad, sad, the bitter wail. I'm going to tell you, it may be getting late to repair those relationships and to, and to make things right. Here's my question to you, and I think it's an important question. Is the offense going to be as important in eternity as it seems that it is right now? If, if it is, okay. I'm not talking to people that, that somebody's murdered your loved one and you're struggling. I know there's processes that go through this. Sometimes forgiveness does more for us than it does anyone. It frees us, not them. So I understand that. But, but, but what I'm talking about right now, I'm talking about petty things. Things that really aren't going to really matter there nearly as much as they matter here. Most, most shattered relationships aren't shattered over something that, that, that is of great moral value or, 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 or of something that is, that, that is really earth-shaking. Most of them are, in comparison with eternity, they're petty. It requires one person to have enough Christianity in character to say, I'm just going to let that one go. I'm going, to, I'm going to let bygones be bygones, and I'm going to move on with life and with relationships. I think I've told you the story of a camp that I did in Georgia. It was a dark, rainy night, that hot summer day in June. The service was over and kids were kneeling around the altar. We had preached on the family and there were kids getting their heart right and determining to be better with their parents at home. And A young girl walked up on the edge of the platform and talked with the camp director and as, he talked, as she talked with him, I saw him nod his head in the affirmative. This had never happened before, but he led her over by the arm and stood her behind the pulpit. Johnny Pope, my friend, had preached that night, and he stepped to the side, and she got behind the pulpit, and she told a story. She said, my mom, and dad fought all, my mom and I fought all the time. My dad left us and abandoned many years ago. My mother raised me as a single parent. We were always at each other's throat. It seemed like we couldn't agree on anything. I thought she was always intruding into my life and didn't trust me and wouldn't leave me alone, and... I told her so. She said I was a teenager and got to the age to where I felt like I knew more than she knew and I could talk back. And so I was constantly, I was constantly mouthing back at my mom. Sometimes she would get emotional and tell me she was just trying to help me, but, but I wouldn't listen because I knew better than she knew. One morning, she said, we had a big eruption and I, I was just angry because it seemed like I couldn't get out the door without her giving me advice on what to do and how to handle myself. And I wanted to be left alone. Let me live my, it's my life. Let me live my life my way. So she said in a fit of anger, I looked at my mother and I said, you know what? I hate you. I simply hate you. I stormed out of the kitchen through the laundry room into the garage and sat in the car. A few minutes later, my mother came out to ride, drive me to school, and she said her eyes were welted. She had obviously been crying. We sat in the car in absolute silence as my mother backed out and drove me to the school. As we got, began to approach into the school driveway there, I looked out and saw my friends. They're my friends. They're always the ones who encouraged me. She said, as I got out the car and looked at them, you could see they were sympathetic because I told them about how my mom wasn't, such a good mother. And she said, I took the door and slammed it behind me and went straight to my friends. They all gathered around me and made me, you know, just feel better. What's wrong? What happened? And he, she said, I heard my mother's car slowly pull off. My friends understood me. They knew. They knew how unfair life had been. She said, another hour later, we had, hour and a half later, we had a break after one of our First period classes, went out to the area, was gathered there. While we're talking and just sharing the events of the week with each other, 
that noise, that sound that, <clears throat> that arrests everybody's attention came by. It was an ambulance. It sped by. We all stopped talking and just watched it go by and disappear. She said the bell rang a few minutes later. We went to class. I'm sitting in class. The knock came at our door, and there was a counselor, and she said, talked with the teacher. The teacher came over and said, they need you in the office. The counselor walked with me in silence as we came. I'm thinking in my head, what have I done wrong? What's happened? Why are they calling me here? She said, as we stepped into the principal's office, there sat the principal and a Georgia State patrolman. They had me sit down, and the Georgia State patrolman said, I hate to tell you this news, but this morning a friend went over your house to have tea with your mother. She walked in the house into the kitchen, and your mother was dead on the tile floor. She had a massive heart attack. When she said that, that young girl began to cry from a depth that at that time Early in my ministry, I had never heard. It came from the soul. It, it was a cry that I cannot describe. And her young body just was racked with emotion. As she stood behind that pulpit and sobbed over and over, and this is what she said. She pointed her finger out and she said this, It's too late for me. It's too late for me. But for many of you, you still have the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I love you. Boy, I want to tell you something. That altar was packed five and six deep with young people getting their hearts right and realizing that there were some relationships they needed to repair. Now, I don't know who that is with you. It could be your mom or it could be your mate or it could be your child. I don't know. But it could be getting late early what about your relationship with jesus christ that's the most important the whole purpose and reason why he came is to die for your sins it's not just the sins of the whole world yes but it's personal you do you have a personal relationship with you i'm not asking you if you're a baptist i'm not asking you i'm not asking you do you go to church regularly i'm not asking you i'm asking you this do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you ever been saved? Jesse Ayers, would you stand up just for a moment? I'm, not, I'm sorry to embarrass you. I said something like this a couple of years ago, Jesse, if I remember correctly. Jesse was sitting right up front. As soon as I finished, she walked up to me, and she said this to me, Pastor, I need to get saved. And that day, while I was preaching, in the back, Jessie Ayers put her faith and trust in Jesus. She was a part of our church, but she wasn't a part of his relationship. Thank you, Jesse. So what I'm asking you today is, listen to this. Do you know that you know that you know you're going to heaven? Listen to this. Are you 100% sure that if you died today, you'd be in heaven with Christ? Let's bow our heads. Could we do that? It may be getting late early. It may be later than we think. Do you know Jesus today? If you're here today, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you. I just want to ask you a question. Maybe you're watching on live stream. I want to ask you, everybody that hears me today, do you know Jesus Christ? Are you saved? How many of you by an uplifted hand would say, Pastor, beyond any shadow of a doubt, I know that I'm going to heaven. Here's my hand. I've been saved. All right? Good. Wonderful. Thank you for that. That's important. That relationship with Christ is what's vital. It's not about being a good person. That's not how you get to heaven. Because being a good person is about you. It's about Him. And what He did for good people and bad people and in-between people. Right where you are. 
in the quietness of your own heart, if you'll just ask Christ to come into your heart and life, just pray a simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I deserve hell, but I ask you to come into my heart, come into my life to be my personal Savior. I ask you to save me, Lord Jesus. Be my Savior today. He'll do just that. He'll save your soul. Don't put that off. If we can take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure afterwards, we'll be glad to sit down and I'll show you the very same scripture that Bobby Richardson showed me when I was a 12-year-old boy. You can have the joy and peace of knowing Christ as your Savior. If you've got shattered relationships, you need to rebuild and repair. Maybe there are ways, vices, habits in your life you need to get rid of. Bury them now. It's getting late early. Maybe it's getting late early. Get things done now while you can. Amen. All right, thank you. Now, I want to do two things. I'm going to have Jeff and Kayla come up for just a moment. I'm going to just have a word of prayer.